On September 15, 1981, a boy named Jack Sawyer stood where the water and the land come together, hands in the pockets of his jeans, looking out at the steady Atlantic. He was 12 years old and tall for his age. The sea breeze swept back his brown hair, probably too long, from a fine, clear brow. He stood there, filled with the confused and painful emotions he had lived for with the, for the last three months, since the time when his mother had closed their house on Rodeo Drive in Los Angeles and, in a flurry of furniture, checks and real estate agents, rented an apartment on Central Park West. From that apartment, they had fled to this quiet resort on New Hampshire, teeny Seacoast. Order and regularity had disappeared from Jack's world. The Talisman is one of Stephen King's least known novels. This is partly because it's not just a Stephen King novel. He co-wrote it with Peter Straub, author of Ghost Story, and partly because it is not horror. It's a fantasy novel with some horror elements, and that tends to be a bit of a turn-off for hardcore fans of the King. It is also one of the very few early King novels that has never been adapted to the screen, big or small. There have been rumblings about it for as long as the novel has been published in 1984, and in 2008, a short film, more like a demo really, was released introducing Jack and his mother. But unfortunately, nothing more came from that. A lot of names have been attached to the project, including Keanu Reeves, Leonardo DiCaprio, and River Phoenix, which gives you an idea of how long people have been talking about a talisman movie. In 2021, Amblin announced that they were working on a miniseries with Netflix, but nothing more has been said about the project. And yet, it is one book that is dear and near to some King fans, including me. On one hand, it was the first non-Dark Tower book that had a sequel, years before Doctor Sleep, and on the other, it is not quite right to call it a non-Dark Tower book, as it's adjacent to it. Parallel, one might say. In fact, by the time the sequel, Black House, was published, it was official that the territories were yet another world parallel to all world. And even in the original book, Jack mirrors Jake Chamber's sentiment about how there are far more worlds than the, just two. But I am getting ahead of myself, as always. I'm Adalisa Sarate. And today, we're going to into a very special trip across the U.S. and the parallel world that is only known as the Territories. We will start at the White Hotel in New Hampshire and make our way to the Black Hotel in California. And once there, we will grab Stephen King and Peter Strauss, the Talisman. In 1977, King and his family moved to London for three months. While their stay was short, in those months, they met and befriended the Straub family. And since both Stephen King and Peter Straub were writers, they started toying with the idea of writing a book together. By the time the King returned to the States, nothing was written on a stone or paper. But years later, when the Straubs moved from England to America, they retook the project that was published in 1984, being something quite different from what broad writers were known for. I will be the first one to admit that I am not that familiar with Peter Stroff's work to be able to pinpoint exactly what was a Stroff in the book, but it is quite obvious that collaboration helped King with his dark thoughts, as the talisman is far cheerier than Pet Cemetery. Okay, that is not hard to manage. Uh, but it's also cheerier than Christine and Cujo, and none of the books that followed could go as dark as those three got. At least not until King's Highway Accident, much, much later, and in a different kind of darkness. In fact, The Talisman is the first book with King's name on it that has an unequivocal happy ending where pretty much everyone who lives is better off than when they started, which means that that has to be Strauss' work because really it's completely out of character for Mr. King. So what is The Talisman about? Jack Sawyer is 12 years old, and his mother is both running away and dying. He knows this despite the fact that she has not actually told him because Jack is young, but he's not blind. They have been moving away from his natal California ever since his father died in a hunting accident. 
And her declining health is quite obvious, even without him eavesdropping on her phone conversations with her agent, his late father's best friend, Morgan Sloat. As they move into the Alhambra Hotel in New Hampshire, and Jack's mother, Lily, retreats more and more into herself, he meets a, Jack, he meets a man called Speedy Parker, who seems to know more than he should about Jack, his mother, his father, and Morgan. Thanks to Speedy, Jack remembers how, when he was younger, he used to travel to a different world that he called the Daydreams. But that place is not a dream. It's a real place called the Territories, where some people, like Speedy and Jack's father, have a twin, a tweener, who shares their life and fate. Jack is very special, as his own tweener died when he was a baby, but Jack survived, making him a very, very unique single. And Jack's mother tweener, well, she is the queen of all territories, and she's also dying. But if the queen dies, both our world and the territories are doomed. Armed with that knowledge, Jack starts a quest to save both of them. He needs to travel both through our world and the territories to the west, to a place known as the Black Hotel, where he will find something called the Talisman. Speedy doesn't quite tell him what the Talisman is, but Jack knows that it will save his mother and the queen, so he will do everything in his power, risk everything, even if he's only 12, in order to get it. Unfortunately, his uncle, Morgan, also has a tweener. And Morgan of Horus is quite ready to see the queen and her not son die. There is a lot to say about Jack and his trip, but since it's very similar in many points to the exact same subjects of fate we will see later in other books, I want to focus on something that pops up a lot in King's works. And it's quite interesting on this particular story, which is the relationship between fathers and sons, and more importantly, how the actions of the father affects the son. We have seen some horrible parenting in previous books, although mostly on the side of the mothers during the novels. But fathers are usually already dead by the time we get to the stories, and we only read about them on flashbacks, the one exception being Jack Torrance, who is not really a bad father, but we have talked about that already. Check my The Shining video if you want to hear more. But here we see that both good parents and bad parents can affect children differently. Jack travels begin because his father, the late and good Phil Sawyer, introduced his best friend Morgan Sloat to the territories, and Morgan's great convenient with his twinners Morgan of Horus ambition turned part of the territories into a ni nuclear nightmare. Because the Morgans decided to get rid of Phil and his twinner, and, more importantly, of the queen of the territories who happened to be Jack's mother, then we have Jack in trouble. But the most important thing here is Phil's actions that created this whole mess have absolutely nothing to do with Jack. There was no way Phil would know how this would affect Jack. So, because of Phil, in an act that his twinner couldn't do on time, saved Jack's life when Jack was a baby, and so Joe, Jack became a single, that affects the kid even more. As a single, Jack is the one person who can travel to the territories and back without having a double in the other land, and this makes Morgan Slot worry because he realizes that he needs to get rid of Jack before he rediscovers the truth. Because see, when tweeners travel to the territories, they replace their tweener, whatever the tweener may be. It's a mind meld of sorts. But Jack, having no tweener, physically travels to the territories, so he moves forward wherever he was in the territories or in America. It's a very interesting way to travel, by the way. So, we don't know enough about Phil Sawyer to know if his son is following his steps or not. Yes, everyone who talks about Phil in the territories seem to love him, but at the same time, Jake's late twinner is somehow considered a deity, so it's hard to know if Phil's twinner was loved because he was good, 
or because he was connected to Queen and thus to Jason, her son, who again is treated like Jesus Christ in the territory, so... <laughs> However, there are two other pairs of fathers and sons in the territories who are a lot less vague in nature. The first one is Robert's son like Gardner, whom we originally meet not as a father, but as a father figure. He is, in our world, a preacher who also has a home for troubled children who all adore him and would kill for him. And that is not figuratively, it's actually literal. In the territories, he's Osmond, Morgan of Horry's second in command, and a very cruel man who enjoys whipping people to death. And from the very beginning, he has his eye on Jack, suspecting that he is the kid who both Morgans wanted first, and later, when he is sure of it, Osmond is ready to kill the boy for his masters. When we see Gardner with the children, forcing them to confess menial signs, fanatically convincing them that they are evil for the simple fact that they are boys, it's hard to imagine him having any fatherly feelings. He's a sadistic monster who should never have any contact with young people. Or people. But later we meet his son, Ruel, and we realize that in a very twisted way, Osmond Gardner loves someone more than he loves Morgan and the power Morgan wields. Rule is not present in his home for troubled children that doubles as a slave mine in the territories. Instead, he's comfortably kept in Chicago, at the Chicago Tires Private School, where he can be treated for his epilepsy. Because, see, Rule is as evil as his father sadistic and prone to bullying others less fortunate or rich than him, but it is possible to have some pity for him. He suffers terrible epileptic attacks for no apparent reasons. But in the last leg of Jack's journey, we find out why. Ruel's twinner, Osmond son, is a monstrous mutant bluff with tentacles instead of arms and unable to reason. This is in part due to Ruel's own evil, but also because living in the west of the territories, the child was often brought close to what is called the blasted lands. And although no one in the territories knew exactly why the blasted lands were dangerous, for Jack it's quite obvious. They are radioactive. And thus, Ruel is a monster, used as part of his father's army to serve Morgan and his interactions. And one might wonder if Ruel's evil does not come also from the fact that, well, his twinner has no brain, is only an animal ready to attack. After meeting Gardner's followers, the children, who in the territories happen to be monstrous gargoyles, and thousands of fantasy stories before where the children of billions are billions themselves, it's natural to expect that Richard Sloat would be just a mini version of his father, Morgan. Yes, Jack wants to reach him, especially after losing his territory's friend, Wolf, but we, the readers, have read enough fantasy to know that, of course, there's no possibility for the son of a man who was willing to kill his best friend for power to be a good person. And yet, King and Stroff surprise us. Richard is nothing like Morgan, even if at the beginning he doesn't believe Jack's story. And it's not just because Jack's story sounds crazy. I mean, who would believe that your runaway best friend is traveling between our world and through a fantasy world? It is because Richard, all his life, has rejected any hint of magic to the point of not even reading fictional novels. So when Jack comes in talking about portals to other worlds, werewolves and magic, Richard simply closes up and considers that probably Jack got drugged on the way from New Hampshire to Chicago. But even if he doesn't believe Jack, Richard doesn't throw him away nor call his father. Instead, he lets Jack sleep on his room and brings him food as his private school starts slipping into a horror landscape. It's a bit sad and funny, by the way, how Richard's desire to ignore magic goes as far as him breaking his glasses in order to be able to claim that he can't see what is going on. 
But Richard steadfast belief that magic doesn't exist, even as his school walls started popping up weird white worms with sharp teeth, is not just a stubbornness. Like Jack's, Richard's twinner died when they were two years old, so he is a single. He can also travel to the territories just like Jack, but unlike Jack's early childhood visits to the daydreams where everything just looked and feel better, Richard's one and only visit to the territories was traumatic. He followed his father into a closet when he was about four or five and was almost killed by a dark tree without his father even noticing he had been followed. Because you see, Richard is Morgan's first victim. Even before he started plotting to kill Phil and Lily, Morgan's evilness was starting to affect Richard's without either noticing. At the beginning of the novel, when we first meet Richard and Morgan, we don't see this. We see their relationship as that of an evil but loving parent and his gullible but ignorant son. Morgan even thinks to himself that Richard is his heir, but it's better to keep him in the dark about the territories and his plans for now, especially as he has to get rid of his son's best friend, Jack, in order to control the territories completely. But as the novel progresses and Jack gets closer to the talisman, Morgan goes between completely ignoring that his son may have a role to play to declare his son dead once he finds out that Richard is with Jack. He never tells his followers to keep Richard alive or even considers that Richard could survive with Jack or survive if Jack died. He simply writes off Richard as dead and his sadness is simply to remember his own father a preacher that never saw Morgan as anything but an extension of himself and his words. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world if he should lose his own son? Unfortunately, Morgan's answer is, it would profit, it would profit him the world, and that's enough. It's a little after that when Richard finally admits to Jack not only that he vaguely remembers the territories and he knew that his father associates were not good, but also his reason to forget, which is probably the saddest and most terrifying things of the whole book, especially when we compare it to Morgan's casual dismissal of his son as, his, as a sacrifice. And I quote, I was afraid, Richard said in a perfectly calm voice. I was afraid that if I knew any more about those secret pockets, that man Osmond, or what was in the closet that time, I wouldn't be able to love my father anymore. And I was right. In that moment, Richard faces something worse than anything Jack faced on his trip. The undeniable truth that his own father, the man he loved more than anything in the world, is a monster. And even if they both survived the end confrontation, Richard would not love him anymore. The Talisman is a wonderful read, even if it's not as known or popular as other King's books. It's different, of course, and if I had to describe it somehow, it would be as the never-ending story by the way of Stephen King and Peter Straw. If you like fantasy with a bit of dark age, you are going to love it. And if you are a Peter Straw fan, I guess you will too. Again, I need to read more of him to be able to separate what he wrote from what Kings wrote. There is a Netflix adaptation coming, or so they say, so pick up the book before, just to know how it goes before they make changes. I want to thank my dear patrons, Mitch Hyman, Elaine Ho, and Jessica, as well as my first supporter, Tanya Pineda, and the best human in the whole world, Amy Sank, without whom this video and the ones that follow will not be possible. I also want to remind you that if you want to support these and my other projects and get your name mentioned here, you can do so at patreon.com slash Adalisa. Create a link in the description with my link tree as I know my name can be hard to spell. And with just $1 a month, you will always be thanked in my videos as well as get access to a ton of art before anyone else. If you can't support me this way, I also accept likes, subscriptions to the channel, comments so that the algorithm catches engagement, and of course, you sharing the links. 
And for this time only, if you are in San Diego and happen to go to the San Diego Comic Con Special Edition, I will be there waiting at the Artist Alley table DD42. And I hope to see you here next time when we brave one of the deadliest towns in King's Maine, the strange town of Derry, as we explore Stephen King's Eat.